This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show for CPAs, where we're always discovering how to build better clients, a better practice, and a better life. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of the Wealth Ability Network. So it's April. What are you doing right now? If you are doing something that you wish you weren't doing, then you may just be stuck and you may be feeling stuck. And I know this feeling because I did what you're doing for years and years and years um, in reviewing uh, tax returns, um, preparing tax returns, doing this stuff. And I'm just going, you know what? I don't like doing that. I'm not, um, I'm not the best tax preparer on earth. I'm really good at planning, but not good at preparing. And I wanted to get unstuck. And I've spent literally years working to get unstuck. And we are so fortunate today to have an expert on getting unstuck. Britt Frank, welcome to the Wealth Ability Show for CPAs. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here. So Britt wrote the book called The Science of Stuck. And uh, so, Britt, what got you into this whole um, this whole area of, of, you know, people being stuck and getting unstuck and, 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 and feeling like they don't have control over their life? The business of stuck. Yeah. So I'm a psychotherapist and I'm a trauma specialist and I have a private practice where I do therapy. And what I've noticed over the years is a lot of my therapy clients didn't have major mental health issues. They didn't have huge you know, traumas or horrible childhoods, but they were really locked in the gap between knowing what they should do and not doing it. And so I've noticed that it actually doesn't take 10 years in psychoanalysis to really get moving and to mobilize in a positive direction. And I wrote the book for anybody that feels like, okay, is it me? Am I lazy? Am I crazy? Am I unmotivated? And knowing just a little bit about the brain and about these mechanisms that keep us stuck can have really powerful impacts on our lives and our relationships and on all of the things that we want to do. So let me ask you a question. The, the first question that comes to my mind, which is uh, how do we get stuck? How, how, do, how do we fall into that trap of, of feeling stuck? Hmm. It's such a, and there's a bajillion, I mean, there's as many reasons to get stuck as there are humans. So my big disclaimer is all of this information is for people who are in a safe enough environment, who have relative access to resources and their basic needs met. You know, if you're stuck because you're in a war-torn country, that is not the situation to which I refer. So why do we get stuck? A lot of times we get stuck because we don't have accurate information. You know, if I was in my car mm -hmm. and my car was out of gas and I didn't know that cars need gas to drive, I would sit there and I would be going, Going crazy. I would be like, what's wrong with this car? What's wrong with me? Am I just a bad driver? Is there something inherently wrong with me? And not having accurate information will render all of us stuck. And unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation about why we do what we do that circulates out in the world. And lack of information is a huge you know, pain point that keeps us stuck. And the other one is, well, once we have the right information and we're still not doing the things that we know we're supposed to do, then that becomes not understanding how our brains perceive safety and danger and how our amygdala shuts us down. And that procrastination is a physical response. It's not a mindset issue. So lack of information and then not understanding that we have brains that do what they do automatically and we don't get a conscious say in what it does. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's a big point because if you don't know what the problem is, then you can't solve the problem, right? I mean, it's, it's that simple. Um, it, and a lot of times we have to, and to me, that's what psychoanalysis is all about, right? It's finding what's the real problem because in, uh, we, we see what the symptoms are. We see what the manifestations are of the problem, but we don't actually understand the problem itself. And that's the whole reason for the counseling, the psychoanalysis, et cetera. Um, and so we have to de determine what that, you know, what got us there in the first place and understand how to do that. So how do you go about determining what the problem is that got you stuck in the first place? And so here's where I'm going to flip this. Now, as a psychotherapist, I love analysis and I love understanding why will we do what we do. However, in these unprecedented times of global crisis, I found that asking why is not helpful. Getting into the, well, why do I feel this way? And why am I doing this? Creates sort of an analysis paralysis. Mm. And knowing why a building's on fire doesn't put the fire out. 
it's helpful. It can be useful, but a much better question than why am I doing this? is this, what are my choices and what am I willing to do today about it? Mm. Because if you turn a why into a what, then you're going to get moving a lot faster. Cause I can sit on my couch all day with here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it doesn't get me moving. Asking myself, what are 10 choices that are available to me right now? And of those 10, what's one I'm willing to do that will get us going a lot faster than sitting there figuring out, you know, what happened to me in childhood and where was I rejected as a teenager? And that stuff is useful and it's important, but really if you want to get unstuck, don't ask why ask, what are my choices and what am I willing to do today? You know, I, I, I love that because as, as I was thinking about this show, as I was preparing for this, I'm going, so if, if you're not doing what you wish you were doing, what do you wish you were doing? And what are your choices on doing what you wish you were doing? I mean, like I said, I mean, I spent um, 25 years running a CPA firm. Before that, I was in big four accounting and did tax returns and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going, you know what? That's not me. I don't, you know, there, there were times when I was working 3,500 hours a year. And so not only do you have stuck, but now you have burnout com combined with stuck, right? And what I found was, is that it, it really is simple as making the decision. And it's, it's like you say, what, what am I willing to do? right? What, what actions am I willing to take? Am I willing to step out? Am I willing to do that? And am I willing to do, do am I willing to do what I really want to do? I mean, to me, that's part of it, isn't it? It's sort of a radical commitment to honesty because the fact is, is there are things we're not willing to do and we can try to obfuscate and minimize and avoid it and deny it and lie to ourselves about it. But what if we just started with, hey, I want to get you know, my finances in order, but I am not willing to go look at what my debt is. Okay, great. That's not, you're not willing to do that. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to get out your computer and at least turn it on? Are you willing to maybe sit and answer an email? Are you willing to look up 10 resources for people when you are ready who can help you? So if you're not ready to do the thing, whatever the, the big thing is, Okay, like you don't have to fight with yourself about that. Break it down into the smallest possible way to get to a yes. And we're very quick to invalidate and minimize that. Well, yeah, I went for a walk around the block, but I didn't run the five miles that I should have. Okay, well, you did the walk. And those small shifts compound and very quickly small moves will create big transformations. But we either are not willing to find a yes. And then we're, once we do the yes, we invalidate it. And we undo all of the good work we've done with that tiny little yes. Whatever you're yet, you know, stuck turns into unstuck the second you say yes to something, to anything. Doesn't have to be the big thing. But the second you hit go, you're unstuck. So that reminds me of one of my favorite books, Ryan Holiday's uh, The Obstacle is the Way. And um, where he talks about, look, look at that obstacle as that's your opportunity. And so you're saying, basically you're saying, yes, here's this ob obstacle. So what do I do with it? And how, how, do, how do you use that in your, I mean, so we're talking, I mean, a lot of people listening, they're either in a CPA firm or they run a CPA firm and they're going, wait a minute, I've got all these obligations and I've got to feed my family and I've got to take care of my clients. And how do we get out? How do we get out of that enough to say, okay, what what is the obstacle, and how do I actually use that obstacle to get out of my own way? Well, and for a spe and I see this all of the time because I work with a lot of very successful, high functioning people who will not. Well, my clients do, but who previously would not admit that they're in pain, mm -hmm. and you know, saying, hey, I'm actually not okay in this area. I'm really, I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm hurt. I'm struggling, whatever. And especially when we do the comparison thing, well, it's not like I'm over in Europe right now. I have no right to complain. Well, yeah, I'm burnt out and I'm, you know, super angry at such and such and whatever, but I have a lot of money, so I have no right to complain. So having perspective on privilege and access to resources is great. But if you don't start by naming, you're actually not okay in this area. You cannot solve a problem that you refuse to name. And I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And a lot of high functioning people can I'm fine their way and white knuckle and muscle through their lives. But that's no way to live. And that's certainly not thriving. So can it be okay? And I see everyone up close. We're all a mess in some area. We don't all have it on all cylinders in every single area. So can it be okay? 
that right now this is a pain point for you. And then Mm. what are my choices? And then what am I willing to do? But if you're not willing to identify a pain point, there's absolutely no way you're going to get moving in any direction. If you avoid, deny, minimize, or excuse, you're stuck. So let's just start with what's true. What's true? It sounds so simple, but it's powerful and it works. Okay. So let's take a simple example. One that everybody, well, most people um, uh, uh, have dealt with. And let's look at weight. Okay. You get stuck on a certain weight. This is a physiological thing. I, I know my doctor explains that, you know, you get, you get to a, a point you go, your body gets comfortable with that rate, so weight. So you're stuck at that weight. So, so just take us through as an example, um, like you say, well, we're not willing to admit, well, we're not willing to step on the scale. What are we willing to do? So t- can you use that as an example and just kind of take us through what would you do to get unstuck from that weight? Sure. Well, the first thing I would do as an anti-diet therapist is throw the scale away and not be ruled by a number because how, and I've struggled with weight. I've had eating disorders. I've been like a bunch of different sizes on the scale. How often do we see that number and immediately go, well, forget it. I gained one pound. So I might as well chuck the whole diet out the window and just go crazy. So I, I do not, you know, with finances being ruled by numbers is great. With weight being ruled by numbers is completely suboptimal. So I would ask, the question then, what is the best, and this is, you'll love this as a finance person, do a cost benefit analysis of not losing the weight. There is a reason that you are choosing or not choosing. There's a reason that we get stuck and it's because there is a benefit to it. One of the reasons some pe- some people don't want to get fit is because then sex is now on the table and now they're attractive and now that's really threatening. And then who's not going to like them anymore? You know, if you can sort of stay safe in, you know, a body that isn't the right optimal size for you, it's a really good way to hide from the world. And I've done that, especially if you have trauma in your history, you know, it's very, very easy to get comfortable and shut the world out by trying to manipulate the size on the scale. So if you're not willing to do a cost benefit analysis and just focus on, I need to lose weight. I need to lose weight. I have to lose weight. It's like, okay, cool. Hang on, hang on a second. What is the benefit to what you're doing? When the cost of what you're doing is higher than the benefit of what you're doing, you'll make a change. And until that cost benefit ratio shifts, nothing's going to happen. And we have to start there because that's what fuels the change process. I love how you talk in accounting terms. This is so exciting. <laughs> cost benefit analysis, something we all relate to cost benefit analysis. I, 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 I love it. Um, and it's absolutely true, right? I had a, um, I was married to a person once who lost a lot of weight and was upset that everybody paid attention to her. Now that she lost weight, she got really upset and she put all the weight back on. She says, if you don't like me for how I was, then I'm going to go back to how I was and you can just deal with it. And, and I mean, that was the court and she, she'd had trauma in her life and I, I get all that. And there's a lot more to that story, obviously, but, um, but that's a really interesting point is that what is the benefit you're getting out of where you are right now? So if you look at, okay, I'm stuck doing tax returns, what's the benefit? Well, I don't have to think about it. I mean, I can think of some benefits right now, right? I don't think about it. I'm busy. I don't have to deal with personal stuff. Wow. April, April 6th comes along and guess what? Everybody leaves me alone. They go, I mean, what's the funny thing about this, Brett, is that people will be so generous with me right now. And they'll go, oh my heavens, it's April. You must be so busy. I, you know, I'm not going to bother you. I'm going, so I, I look at like one tax return every three weeks, right? I mean, I don't do that work. I mean, I run a CPA firm, but I don't, I, I uh, purposely chosen that that's not what I want to spend my time at. And, uh, but I get a lot of, there, uh, there, is, there are some benefits there. Right now, I get the benefits without having to go through the pain, which is completely unfair. Okay, but I'm not going to turn it down. Right. So, um, so when when you look at those uh, that cost benefit analysis, how do you how do you even how do you even say, well, okay, what's what's the real be- you know how do you find the cost? I mean, are you just saying that look, if you're stuck and you're happy being stuck, maybe I'd just say stuck. There are some people who don't want to change. There are some people who genuinely are like, hey, I'm fine. I'm functional enough. I don't want more. I don't want bigger. I don't want better. I'm good here. Like, okay, cool. You do you. But to say that there are no benefits to staying stuck is a lie. And if we deviate from what's true, we're going to stay stuck. So 
other examples of benefits of staying stuck. Cause some people are like, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no drug addiction as a biggie. And I was a drug addict and I could say, well, there was no benefit to something that was destroying me. Of course there was, course. if you don't, and I'll use something a little bit less intense. I'm not launching my business. There's a, you know, a business I want to not me. I'm just making this up. There's a business I want to launch, but I'm stuck. I'm not making the calls. I'm not doing the things. Great. If you don't ever launch that business, you don't have to risk failure. You don't have to risk social rejection. You don't have to risk financial resources. I love what you said. You know, the holiday season for therapists is what tax season is for accountants. Like right. that's like our busy season. And what you're saying is so true. I could go through October. I can go through the entire fourth quarter and never once think about, hey, where am I sad? Where am I angry? Because I can get incredibly incredibly busy with other people's stuff. And so that's a benefit. Now, then the question is, what's the cost? What's the cost to my health? What's the cost to my sanity? What's the cost to my relationships? But you have to take an inventory, right? Any business that doesn't take inventory will very quickly go out of business. So let's take an inventory of everything that you're getting and everything that it's costing you. And if you're getting more than it's costing you, then okay, then why bother changing it? So we want to shift that, but we have to start with name it. So taking the, all of these business skills are actually incredibly applicable to the change process in therapy and wellness and motivation and mental health. And I wish there was more crossover. That's why I was so excited mm -hmm. when you rang my bell. I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, because you have the tools that we need. So if you can apply all of these tools to your own personal sense of stuck, you already have the skill set. Let's just apply, sit down with a spreadsheet cost benefit to staying at this weight, cost benefit to drinking a pack of whatever a night, cost benefit to whatever the thing is that you say you want to change. And then once we take inventory, then we can create strategies. And then we can see, is there trauma that we have to deal with? Or is there something else that's going on that we have to, is it just another skill you need to learn? Is it more information? But step one is name the problem, take inventory, cost benefit analysis. Step two, what are your choices? Step three, what are you willing to do today? Yeah. So one of the things I like to do is, um, and I do this regularly, I like to list out everything I'm doing. And then I like to, I, I like to push it into, uh, I, use different quadrants and I'm going, all right, what, do, what am I doing that I love to do and that I'm uniquely suited to do? And that goes in this quadrant. And then what, are, what am I doing that I absolutely hate to do? And I'm really not very good at that goes in that opposite quadrant. Right. And then there's all the, there's all the others, right. Where my goal is constantly. And the reason I do this all the time is because I always want, I want everything I do to be in that one quadrant. I want everything to be doing. I, I'm doing that. This is something that Really, I am the best person to do it, and I love doing it. That's the dream, right? And the whole, you know, the quadrants of doing what's urgent at the expense of what's important and always being in crisis management mode. I would love to only do the things that I love too. And in order to get to that box of doing what you love, sometimes you have to do things that you don't love. But the question to really ask as you're assessing everything you're doing is how important is it that I deal with this issue? I'll use, again, being, I really stink at money management. It is not my skill. It, your world is a total mystery to me. I could sit and analyze for six months. Well, why am I bad at money? And what were my child? It doesn't matter. It's like, what are my choices? There are CPAs who do this and they're good at it and they like it. So am I willing to call one? Yes, I am problem solved. Other things may require a little bit of a deeper dive. And so really assessing if I'm not doing what I love to do and I'm really unhappy, we need to figure out which are the things that we need to like just outsource and which are the things that we need to dig and actually deal with. Yeah. One of my, one of my favorite books is Who Not How. This is a, a Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach. He goes, you know, a lot of, a lot of times the problem is not how to do it. And one of the challenges I think we have as CPAs is we're very, you know, we're in that do it yourself category, right? We're small business owners, self-employed, et cetera. And it, you know, we, we, this old mantra, right? If you want something done, right, you have to do it yourself. Right. And which is completely backwards from how the world works, right? If you want something done, right, get the person who can do it best to do it. And don't you be doing it because the reality is, is that what a lot of, I think what a lot of business owners and, and CPAs in particular are afraid of is, well, but that will cost me money. To me, again, that's still cost benefit analysis. Well, wait a minute though, but what are you giving up? What could you be doing? Because if you're doing what's your unique ability, that's certainly worth a lot more 
than doing things that somebody else could be doing. And frankly, would charge a lot less for it than the amount of time it takes you to learn how to do it, apply it, and then all the energy it takes because you don't want to do it in the first place. And that's a question of what do I value? You know, I'm really big on, I value my time mm -hmm. and I would rather pay someone extra to do in one hour, what would take me 10. And so what do I value is really important for the change process. If you're stuck on a thing, do you value this thing enough to really address it? And a lot of people get stuck in the shame, the, the should trap. Well, this shouldn't be an issue for me. I should know better. And that's actually not helpful. It's, it's not an efficient use of resources to go through through account, you know, taking accountability for our actions is great, but the, I should know better. I should be yeah. able to do this. Why can't I do this? Is a completely inefficient use of resources? Yep. So just in a practical, pragmatic, like energy conservation point of view, asking why, and why is this hard? Why I should be able to do like, I should be able to do my own taxes. Like, okay, great. That's getting me nowhere very quickly. What's true. What do I value? What are my choices and what am I willing to do? And if I'm not willing to do this thing, there's always a yes somewhere. And I will push back on anyone who says to me, I have no choices. Again, assuming they're in a safe enough environment where that's not true. Most of the time that I have no choices here is not true. Where is there a yes? There is always a yes. It might be a microscopic yes, but again, stuck becomes unstuck the second you say yes to anything. And if you're going in the wrong direction, it's like your GPS. If you make a wrong turn, it'll reroute you, but your GPS won't tell you anything unless you hit go. It's if you're sitting in your driveway, you're not going to get that feedback. So you need to be in motion to get feedback and then you can course correct as you go. That's a really important thing to know. Like as long as you're making small moves, there's nothing that you're not going to be able to backpedal and shift and pivot from. So there you go. Stuck becomes unstuck the minute you say yes. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. All right. And the book is, the book is The Science of Stuck. I love the title. It's, a, it's a, what, what a great book. And it's Britt Frank. And Britt, where can we find more about you and about what, and, and your message? Um, so my website, you can find more information about me in the book at scienceofstuck.com. And if you're social media inclined, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Instagram and it's just my name at Britt Frank. Awesome. Thank you so much, Britt. And thank you everybody for listening. This is a time when a lot of us really do feel stuck. And it, it's, a, it's a really, what's great is it's followed by a time where we have some time end of April, 1st of May, we've got a little bit of time and we can reassess, which is why we do our um, CPA leadership conference in, in May uh, 12th through 14th. Please, uh, please look us up on wealthability.com because we love the idea of building leaders in the CPA community because when we have better leadership skills, when we get unstuck, we're always gonna have better clients, a better practice and better life. See you next time. You've been listening to the WealthAbility for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to WealthAbility.com.